the love of water. All nature, from the crag windbreakered in granite that melts into the nuzzling of the cloud's wet snouts, to the motes of grit that rise up every morning and dance in a fountain over the windowsill, all nature wants to be water. Curled tongues of fire and sharp tongues of wind stutter and lisp through forests, longing for the fluency of streams. Clays trapped in marble 50 million years ago still practice ripple and pearl in rehearsal for the eon that will free their liquid hearts. Virginia creeper clambers on splay-fingered hands up walls and tree trunks to throw itself down in cascading sprays. Even heaven seeks out lakes where its unfrozen double pulses. Still more besotted, water dotes on the rest of nature. Rain, the sky's gift of spirit, so pure a distillate of blue it abstains from color, falls all over the earth. And snowflakes leave unique designs they've spun their lives into, coming undone to kiss the same ground the river's whitest water, charging seaward, turns inside out to wave back at. Starving for love, the pilgrim water drop shivers under its hood of light, dwindles to mist, and slips into crevasses between crumbs of soil to rise as breath through root hairs and be at one with the trees. Or with you, for water also loves the nature that is human. Kissing lips, then tongue, it races down throat rapids, threads through bone into your very marrow, and in a blush of passion, spills over and floods the heart's chambers scarlet. Your smitten heart loves back, a lifetime of embraces, fluttering like eyelids when they caress the film of water pressing against your lenses. You look through them at a dead tree leaning across a stream. The bleached trunk so yearns to become water, it has given up branches and bark and working its way from cedar to drift. Now pain puts on a coat of warm water and runs down your cheek. Like the ocean that loved all nature into first life, it kisses you with salt. To Darwin in Chile, 1835. You will learn to look on every city as Venice, stone lofted for a while as sun-draped statue before the tide grinds it to sand. Viewed through the telescopic glass of geology, mountains collapse to seabeds, reptiles leave to return as hummingbirds, scallop shells arise in their brittle white gowns to haunt hilltops banked over the bones of whales. Yet now, a lift with earthquake, floating on dry land is new to you. Earth, the emblem of all that is solid, moves beneath our feet, a crust over a fluid. You are a skater on wafer-thin ice, or a ship skidding over a cross ripple. The cathedral's portal, tilted seawards, is a prow of arched oak scudding over bobbing rubble. So much for founding a church on a rock, you think, when keystones founder, crack, split, fragment. Even the hand-picked Peter broke in a single night, cockcrow finding him marooned in a wreckage of denial. Yet if you could call together all the colored crystals of the east wall's stained glass window, most benign form of rock, stone's thinnest shadow, now shattered to stardust. You would see your life's and this moment's discoveries lightly prefigured in the image of another storm-tossed man whose feet tested Earth's rocky sediment and found it sea foam, walking on water as you do now, as we all do. Riverbank. Like the scroll itself, unsheltered by glass, uncontained by frame. The hermitage in Dung Yuan's scroll opens on water, which is the weave of the costumes of time. Each thin instant of rain, clad only in the brushstroke from a single bristle, dives into the river's wide basin, 
which nearly encircles the pavilion perched over it, and over the pavilion and its outbuildings, broader strokes of water pelt down like hours on the uncovered head of the servant who slow steps her tray across the courtyard, and on the thatch-hooded head of the man whose feet beat quicker time on the path that lollops crosswise from mountains, where waterfalls hurl centuries down to the river in stone-white columns of foam, and where ages before weary ancestors sought refuge from the storm of time, in caves they painted with eternity, deer poised in mid-career, human bodies all winged and feathered liftoff, court musicians forever holding flute notes of longing silence, posed as breath which comes and goes. How brave of their descendants to embrace the shifting vapors beyond the cave, breath shared with other mortals, whose writing they learned to read. Those geese, signing with arrowing wing strokes the coming of winter to Dong Yuan's valley, pines keening and bowing under the approaching storm, the trembling heart-shaped leaves of Paulonia printing on air the fear that floated as words on the moisture of human breath and clings to the scroll's time-darkened silk as sparkling tears of rain from the plough the farmer carries as he leads in through the gateway a boy riding that buffalo, half of whose name and more of whose body is water. Displacement. Sometimes her eyes lidded in afternoon sun, the skin of her hands butterfly wing thin paper, watermarked by streaming clouds. She opens and closes the conjoined red paper cut fish, as if, as if each half were the slowly clasping and unclasping wing of a perched butterfly, the twin carp having turned gills to lungs, able to sip and ride air's currents as they did waters, this kissing couple displaced from their river home as she from hers on her perch now, dream-catching the river's whisper in rapids of traffic far below the white concrete raft of their balcony. So some nights, one with the undimmed flow from the apartment's ductwork, her daughter whispers her from weeping, no cause for tears with child and grandchild here. Your cane chair, your own grandmother's Yixing teapot, your husband's photograph, yet none of them the same, all ghost-thin to her eyes, wanting the play of water lights in the old riverside house their bodies drowned with it, with unripe peaches in the orchard, unpicked beans, with the river itself, its feathery voice lost under the reservoir's mountain of water. She remembers how the end crept up through the last days, no sawtooth waves ripping the shoreline, no dragon bellowing, only a slow theft of land. Each step the flood took no higher than the width of a spider leg. You could see nothing happening, but whenever you turned around, something gone. The garden narrowed by one row, the small green butterfly barred from its pumpkin blossom by a pane of sky that separated what was alive from what had lived. And she wondering, then and now, how could she live apart from the air that had danced with and married her breath, her unrivered heart withered thin as the red paper-cut fish whose wings she now flapped, who could take flight no more than she, twice bereaved, a riverbank's widow. Bluegrass starts with mouth-to-mouth -mouth inspiration from the beige-lipped perfect O of a Martin D28 guitar, where soul on rebound from plucked brass swims up through sound waves and waits humming, 
behind a copse of hair at the mouth of an ear cave for the high lonesome sound another soul breaks into when it breaks as breath out of its white ribbed chest cave slips on a jumpsuit of song from the red walls of the singer's mouth rides the trilled riptide outwards and partners its soulmate to sashay down the vaulted canal career off tautened eardrum toggle hammer on anvil and tickle the coiled up cochlea but the true beginnings of bluegrass echoed through ancient rock caves whose high roofs hummed duets with Stone Age singers and chanted by warm overtones the icy limestone draped around their solitary voices, longing to prolong the partnership between what lasts and what runs out of breath, seeking to carry harmony with them as a body out of the cave, finally lighting on wood carved into a heart shape, too full of singing to taper to a point, curved like a woman gravid with new music, soundboard braced by rosewood ribs, slim neck drawing out voice chords like drops of water drawn into needles wept from cave roofs, brimming with human sorrow, yet plucking joy from hearing unhuman wood echo their song in its own bright voice, even on starless nights, as if they had come at the farthest reach of a cave's dark passage into a place of green skies and blue grass. The monarch butterfly migration, 1943, uh, turns on a conceit, basically, that instead of the monarch butterflies newly hatched uh, in, in Mexico in their winter quarters being the souls of the village dead, uh, they were the souls of all of the dead of Europe in 1943, that year of fire bomb bombings. So the monarch butterfly migration, 1943, is a poem dedicated to and addressed to Homero Arigis, the Mexican poet and environmentalist who grew up in that little town where the monarch butterflies winter. That year, after sun-aproned earth brought forth her paler ochre yield of chickpea and maize, blue air broke into a blossoming of flame. More millions of orange petals than you or your brothers had ever seen, floating free of any bough, or invisibly branching, bloom from a water-clear tree, wider than the mountain, higher than its fur-crowned summit. Monarchs in silk robes rippled along village streets, lapped into open casements, spilled down from pink stucco walls over the cold white skin of crosses where votive candles blinked and wept to welcome home those souls of the village dead, alighting, folding their wings in momentary prayer before taking up winter quarters in the Palace of Furs, pillars their enameled wings mosaiced in return for wood warmth you breathed on morning walks, too young at three to take in how these hangers-on could so outnumber all the souls one town might lose, but wise enough even then to sense a miracle, your word, in their coming. How could your peaceful hills dream of their flying from fire-bombed cities in Europe, know of the flame tornadoes that wrenched trees from earth, gables and roofs from houses, human spirits from the blackened chrysalids of incinerated children, breath-looted elders, bodies shriveled too small for hearts seeking the freedom to fly. Why would they not choose this metamorphosis of flame when cathedrals were shattering, this soft floating stained glass, blazoned like tropical fruit, segments of sun-sweetened fire, contained by the thinnest black bands, unfraught with memory, larval vestiges of crawl and clutch, sloughed off 
in an old world whose wars your namesake darkly sang. O oh, singer facing down a shrieking ground assault where metal fangs gnaw at the cross-tipped steeples of fur that have sanctuaried these fragile monarchs of the unrelenting spirit. O oh, lover of mountain streams that echo the soft rain of rallying wings, sing the rhythms you share with them that heart and butterfly may lift and find their way home.